Max Drezo. I am a PhD candidate at the University of Minnesota and a graduate fellow at the Minnesota Center for Philosophy of Science. And my talk is called Measuring Time with Fossils, a Startup Problem in Scientific Practice. So I'm going to provide a more complete roadmap for this talk in a moment, but to begin, I wanted to highlight two things that I'm going to do in the presentation. First, I'm going to examine how the standardized geological timescale was first assembled, namely by the use of a particular tool, fossils, to measure time. And second, I'm going to explore how this practice was validated in the absence of a sound justifying theory. In other words, how geologists managed, through a collective empirical effort, to remove serious doubts about an important methodological practice. So here we go. The geological time scale is a layer cake of odd names, many of them established in a burst of amazingly fruitful research during the first half of the 19th century. Historian Mott Green describes it as a triumph of intellectual attention to singularity unequaled in the history of human thought. Others have called it the tool par excellence of the geological trade and an invaluable tool for geoscientists investigating virtually any aspect of Earth's development anywhere on the planet. Reviews aren't always so glowing. Irwin and Valentine describe the scale as a residue of 19th century geology, and Ward and Kirschfink call it a rickety old contraption held together by 19th century rules and current European formality. Yet while some may enjoy a pot shot at this icon of their field, geologists of all stripes share a profound admiration for the scale and what it represents nothing less than a synthesis of the geological history of our planet, a geohistory. By the end of the 18th century, it was widely appreciated that the Earth was ancient, far more ancient than the few thousand years accorded to it by biblical literalists. But scientists remained without a strategy for ordering its scattered pages and chapters, rock bodies, into a coherent story, a geohistory. In this, they faced a situation not unlike the hypothetical dilemma that historians would face if they knew that modern cultures had antecedents but did not know whether Cheops preceded Chartres, or indeed whether any culture, however old and different, might not still survive in some uncharted region. While it was simple to infer that rocks near the bottom of the pile were older than those near the top, geologists lacked a reliable way of comparing the ages of widely separated rocks and of ordering these into a coherent sequence. This meant that there was no way of saying whether a stack of rocks in Pembrokeshire was as old as a stack of rocks in the Appalachians, notwithstanding that they might resemble one another in superficial appearance. All of this had changed by the middle of the 19th century. In an explosion of conceptual innovation and empirical expansion, the newly christened science of geology had burst from the gates and set to work disclosing the long and eventful history of the planet. In less than 50 years, a multinational community of researchers had ordered the pile of formations into a concatenation of systems defined by the ever-changing history of life and recorded by a set of names accepted and used in the same way from New York to Moscow. Remarkably, the major features of this history are still recognizable today, at least for the largest divisions of the geological column. Yet no less remarkably, the practice most responsible for this success, the measurement of time using fossils, lacked an adequate theoretical justification during the early decades of the 19th century. It is this observation that supplies the jumping off point for my presentation. In particular, the presentation will explore how the absence of a theoretical justification caused no real disruption in stratigraphic practice during the first half of the 19th century. My argument will be that geologists managed to solve the problem of gnomic measurement, so named by Hasak Chang, or if they didn't solve it, at least they found a way of lessening its sting. The solution was nowhere explicitly formulated, yet it was widely understood that ongoing research had rendered the foundations of stratigraphic practice increasingly secure. This presentation aims to make explicit the logical basis of this largely unarticulated understanding. The remainder of this talk is organized as follows. In section two, I introduce Richard Boyd's notion of a startup problem and suggest that the subject of my presentation can be characterized as a startup problem in scientific practice. In section three, I provide a crash course in 19th century geology, which is followed in section four by a discussion of the problem of justifying paleontological correlation. 
In section five, I consider how this measurement system was justified in practice by a kind of piecemeal strategy as opposed to a theoretical fix-all. Finally, in section six, I conclude with a brief synopsis. So on to section two. My presentation addresses what might be called a startup problem in scientific practice. I owe the term startup problem to Richard Boyd, who speaks of the startup problem in philosophy of science as the problem of explaining the first emergence of approximately true theories within a research tradition, and thus the emergence of the reliable methods they determine. The startup problem is a problem, Boyd thinks, because scientific methods are deeply theory dependent. And as a consequence, it is not an option to explain the emergence of successful scientific theories by appealing to the methods they make possible. In addition, it is not an option to explain their emergence by reference to a more basic theory independent methodology because no such methodology exists. The upshot, Boyd thinks, is that methods must have depended on the logically, epistemically, and historically contingent emergence of a relevantly true theoretical tradition rather than vice versa. Or, to render this as a motto, no epistemically successful scientific methods without a pre-existing theoretical justification. The startup problem I deal with in this presentation is not the same as Boyd's startup problem, for the important reason that it is not concerned with the emergence of an approximately true scientific theory. Rather, it is concerned with the emergence of a methodological practice in the absence of a justifying theory, and indeed in the absence of much interest in providing such a theory. The practice is paleontological correlation, and it consists in the fitting together of rock layers in different parts of the world on the basis of their fossil contents. It's important because prior to the mid 20th century, it was the best way for geologists to compile information from individual outcrops into a regional time scale, and ultimately to synthesize these into a geohistory. As the paleontologist Ronald Goldring puts it, until outcrops are correlated by timelines, there is no way of gaining any real appreciation of the temporal distribution of past environments across an area or within adjacent sedimentary basins let alone of clarifying what was going on at distant points on the globe. This means that absence of reliable means of correlating rocks over long distances, the project of reconstructing geohistory is scarcely possible at all. But why were fossils so important for stratigraphic correlation? In this next part of the talk, I'm going to provide a crash course in stratigraphic geology during the 19th century before turning to the problem of justifying fossil-based correlational practices. Stratigraphy is the study of layered rocks, or strata, but on a more basic level, it is all about time. Stratigraphers are interested in determining the ages of rocks and in using this information to delineate a sequence of geological units that can be recognized throughout a region and even throughout the world. This involves first delineating packages of strata representing discrete units of time, and second, fitting these packages together through a process called correlation. Correlation refers to the practice of matching rock units found in different localities, or to be more precise, of establishing a correspondence between geographically separated parts of a single geological unit. Sometimes called temporal correlation, it is the way geologists seek to establish the time equivalence of rock layers, and by this means to build a time scale applicable over a maximally wide geographical area. The trick is to show that rocks observed in different locations are actually the same age. Rocks don't come time-stamped after all, and since geological evidence is notoriously jumbled and fragmentary, considerable difficulties confront the project of assembling a time scale from the scattered windows afforded by natural and artificial exposures. During the 18th century, mineralogy had supplied the main guide to deciphering the temporal relationship of rock layers, and for weighty theoretical reasons. According to the influential geotheory of German scientist Abraham Werner, all rocks on the surface of the Earth had precipitated from a universal ocean in order of their density. So granites having the highest density precipitated at the earliest period, and less dense rocks like sandstones and limestones precipitated later. Had this theory been correct, temporal correlation would have been a relatively straightforward affair since all that would have been required to locate a rock in the pile of formations would have been information about its mineralogical characteristics, that is, its rock type. Yet Werner's system was untenable, as observations of relatively young granite sufficed to show. 
This did not discredit mineralogy as a guide to unraveling stratigraphic relationships, but it did show that rock type alone could not supply a measuring rod of history, a means of placing rocks in their correct temporal order. Enter fossils. Around the turn of the 19th century, the surveyor William Smith had shown that fossils can be used to distinguish a large number of discrete formations around England and Wales. The most famous result of this demonstration was a map that depicted the succession of British secondary strata at an unprecedented level of detail. Smith produced his map by collecting fossils from particular localities, precisely noting their geographical and stratigraphic placement, and identifying analogous strategies in other locations by finding similar fossils. Those fossils characteristic of a particular stratum, Smith called characteristic fossils. Together they functioned as a kind of reference system for the stratigraphic pile, since finding a characteristic fossil told you that the surrounding rock belonged to this part of the pile as opposed to that part. Well, Smith was not terribly concerned with geohistory. His concerns were rather structural than geohistorical. His method was quickly adopted by geologists interested in constructing a global time scale. A famous example is Sir Roderick Impey Murchison, who declared in 1839 that the zoological contents of rocks, when coupled with their order of superposition, are the only criteria of their age. Smith's work came close to supplying a paradigm for stratigraphic geology in the sense of a model of exemplary practice. In the years following his publication, no geologist could eschew the task of collecting fossils from stratigraphic sections, or at least describing them in a field notebook. Yet Smith's accomplishment did not rise to the status of an exemplar in the robust Kuhnian sense. This is evident from the fact that, in the early decades of the 19th century, Doubts persisted about the priority of fossil evidence in stratigraphic correlation. At issue was precisely the matter that Smith regarded as settled, the reliability of fossils as markers of stratigraphic position and therefore of age. The matter was unsettled because, contrary to Smith's claim to have discovered a law of strata, Smith had discovered no principle that could underwrite the extension of his method to other parts of the world or indeed to other parts of the pile. What Smith had discovered was that fossils could be used to distinguish a large number of formations and that these distinctions could be used to correlate rocks across England and Wales. But it remained an open question whether the existence of certain fossils in a rock reflected the period of time in which that rock was formed, as the method of characteristic fossils required, or whether it sometimes reflected something else, like the presence of certain conditions at the era of fossil potting. The problem was a serious one, and it was clear to many that it would need to be sorted out before any long-distance paleontological correlation could be regarded as more than provisional. Here's the basic issue. By the 1830s, no one denied that fossils had a role to play in stratigraphic correlation. But there remained a question as to what exactly this role should be, especially when geologists ventured beyond the relatively well-behaved secondary formations of Great Britain and continental Europe. The question was important since the use of fossils in correlation had both empirical and theoretical vulnerabilities. On the empirical side, what was missing was a demonstration that fossil assemblages had indeed succeeded one another in time, not merely at a single location, but everywhere in the world these fossil assemblages happened to occur. Absent this demonstration, it would not be possible to infer the age of a rock from the identity of its enclosed fossils, since fossils that occur throughout the column carry no temporal signal. However, in the early decades of the 19th century, knowledge of the spatial and temporal ranges of fossils remained highly fragmentary and almost necessarily parochial. This meant that the use of fossils in correlation rested on an empirical assumption that many regarded as unwarranted, if not downright implausible. On the theoretical side, what was missing was an explanation of why the stratigraphic record is amenable to paleontological correlation. Maybe it couldn't be shown that the history of life consists in a globally consistent linear succession of mostly discrete floras and faunas. Still, if it could be shown that this succession is expected on theoretical grounds, then the absence of an empirical demonstration could be blunted. And by the 1830s, several proposals to this effect had in fact been articulated. On the continent, the formidable Georges Cuvier had offered a theory of revolutions which held that massive calamities in Earth's past had served to establish divisions between successive periods in the history of life. Later, L.A. de Beaumont proposed a similar theory, which held that major periods in geological history were terminated by epochs of elevation, which were associated with marine and terrestrial extinctions. <laughs> 
These theories gained many adherents, at least before the 1840s, when de Beaumont effectively recanted. Still, they were far from universally accepted, especially in Great Britain, where the most famous revolution was a bloodless one, and political history after Cromwell was decidedly less tumultuous than it was in France. A different group of theories appealed to the idea that the Earth was slowly cooling from an incandescent state. Because it was thought that organic life must remain constantly adapted to the Earth's surface, it followed that the community of living things must have changed in order to keep pace with the changing state of the Earth. Advocates of this view did not interpret these changes in evolutionary terms. Rather, they tended to imagine a trickle of extinctions followed occasionally by new creations or else by migrations from different climate zones. Yet even for giving this oversight, the view is based on a false premise. The Earth is not slowly cooling from an incandescent state, and the drama of life's relationship with the planet is more complicated than directionalist theories of the 19th century could comprehend. So, without an empirical demonstration that the fossil record is suitable for correlation, or a widely accepted argument that the record can be trusted in the absence of such a demonstration, geologists face the following dilemma. In order to use the fossil record to correlate strata over large distances, it must be the case that fossil assemblages succeeded one another in an orderly way in time throughout the relevant area. However, to determine whether fossil assemblages succeeded one another in this way, some method is needed to determine whether a fossil succession in one part of the world, for instance, a succession showing the transition from fauna A to fauna B, is contemporaneous with the succession in a different part of the world, which also shows the transition from A to B. But this is what fossils were called upon to do, in particular fossils belonging to faunas A and B. The result was a circularity. Since the practice of correlation presupposed that the transition from A to B happened at the same time throughout the relevant area, it could not establish that this was the case. Something that Thomas Henry Huxley pointed out in an 1862 address to the Geological Society of London. For anything that geology or paleontology are able to show to the contrary, a Devonian fauna and flora in the British Islands may have been contemporaneous with Silurian life in North America, and with a Carboniferous fauna and flora in Africa. Geographical provinces and zones may have been as distinctly marked in the Paleozoic epoch as at present, and those seemingly sudden appearances of new genera and species, which we ascribe to new creation, may be simple results of migration. To mark the absence of any method by which the absolute synchronism of two strata can be demonstrated, Huxley coined the term homotaxis, meaning similarity of arrangement of fossil successions. His point was that paleontological correlation could not establish that fossils succeeded one another in a regular way in time. All it could establish is that fossils occur in a regular vertical order in strata. This, in a word, was the problem with paleontological correlation. To see the problem more clearly, consider the following idealized situation. Here we have two stacks of rocks, one in North America and one in Asia. These stacks are believed to be similar in age, but how do we establish the exact temporal relationships between the stratigraphic sections? Following standard practice, we could perform the following procedure. First, we could characterize the succession of fossils at each location, and second, we could compare these successions to establish relationships of hopefully temporal, correspondence between the sections. And let's just say that the fossil successions look like this, broadly similar at each section. Based on this similarity, we might draw the following inference. Because these fossils succeed one another in the same vertical order at each location, we might draw the following timelines between the two sections. What they indicate is that the rock layers connected by the lines were deposited at about the same time, and in the order suggested by the graphic, with the bottom line corresponding to the earliest date and the top line corresponding to the latest date. Of course, no one expects that this distantly separated rocks were deposited at exactly the same time, but the thought here is that the timelines indicate rough synchrony. So the stratum labeled A was deposited at approximately the same time as the strata labeled A star. According to Huxley, however, this inference is illicit or at least it requires more information before it can be accepted. The reason is that the following situation is entirely possible. Here the three fossil taxa succeed one another in the same vertical order at each location, but the North American succession takes place considerably earlier in time than the Asian succession. In this situation, 
which is not unlike the one Huxley describes in his address, the fossil timelines do not run parallel to absolute timelines. The reason is that they are indexed to a mere homotaxial pattern, as opposed to a worldwide temporal succession of the relevant assemblages. To use fossils to establish the synchronicity of formations, then, something more is required. In particular, we need to know that the fossil timelines are roughly parallel to the absolute timelines. But it doesn't seem like we can know this on the basis of fossils alone. The problem can be further characterized as an instance of what Hasek Chang calls the problem of gnomic measurement. This problem has the following structure. We want to measure some quantity, call it x, but this quantity isn't directly observable, so we infer it from another quantity y, which is directly observable. In order to make this inference, we need a law that expresses x as a function of y, but the form of this function f can't be discovered or tested empirically because that would involve knowing the values of both y and x, but x is that unknown variable that we were trying to measure in the first place. In the present case, x is time, the age of a stratum, y is faunal composition, and f is the form of the relationship between time and faunal composition over a specified area. Early 19th century geologists tended to assume that observed faunal successions reflect real temporal sequences, not just at a single location, but at locations separated by hundreds or even thousands of kilometers. But this was only an assumption. And as Huxley said, it may be so, it may be otherwise. The reason is that fossils measure time only with the assistance of a substantive empirical warrant, namely that the fossil record preserves a worldwide directional signal and that certain events recorded at widely separated exposures are effectively synchronous. And this assumption, again, cannot be definitively verified on the strength of fossil evidence alone. Nonetheless, it was verified, at least to the satisfaction of most geologists. In the next part of the talk, I'm going to consider how this was done. In particular, I will briefly examine the kinds of evidence relevant to assessing the temporal significance of homotaxial patterns, as well as the judgments involved in establishing the time equivalence of paleontological events. Now, it's a remarkable fact about 19th century geology that practitioners were aware of the problem with paleontological correlation, and yet for the most part were not that bothered by it. Yes, there were doubts, not only about particular correlations, but about the tendency to assign fossil evidence priority in correlational practice. But the dominant note in the period was one of optimism and confidence regarding the promise of fossil-based measurements. Indeed, by the time Huxley coined the term homotaxis in the 1860s, the tendency to award fossil evidence the right away in stratigraphic practice had been widely accepted for more than a decade. Were these geologists behaving rashly? Did they overreach in thinking that a geological timescale could be assembled and refined using a theoretically unwarranted fossil-based measurement system? In this section, I will suggest that the answer to these questions is no. 19th century geologists had good reason to think that the succession of fossil assemblages and strata reflected a real historical sequence, at least when the appropriate cross-checks had been performed. Moreover, they had reason to think that certain events in the rock record were at least approximately synchronous over broad geographical areas. Consider a sequence of three fossil assemblages, A, B, and C, with suspected non-overlapping ranges in time. How can a geologist know that the observed succession in the rocks reflects a true temporal sequence as opposed to, say, the result of shifting ecological conditions in an area? To begin, if it's true that the assemblages succeeded one another in the hypothesized temporal order, then it should never be the case that C appears beneath B at an exposure, nor that C or B appears beneath A. Likewise, it should never be the case that these supposedly sequential assemblages appear together in a single stratum. A with B, B with C, etc. Observing any of these forbidden sequences or associations at an exposure is sufficient to disprove the hypothesis that A, B, and C form a non-overlapping temporal sequence. Sufficient, that is, if no plausible explanation of the anomaly exists, such as the inversion of a whole succession of strata or the reworking of sediments following deposition. And while the situation is more complicated, if we hypothesize that A, B, and C succeeded one another in time with overlapping temporal distributions, it remains forbidden that, for example, C should appear before A at any exposure, although it can be expected that B will sometimes appear before A and C before B, just not that often. 
To what extent can cross-checks of this sort justify the claim that assemblages that succeed one another in strata also succeeded one another in time? Clearly, they can't prove this. Even if every observed succession is compatible with the hypothesis that A, B, and C succeeded one another in time, this does not establish that they in fact did so. Perhaps in every case the apparent temporal succession was due to an accident of preservation, and A, B, and C in fact existed for exactly the same period of time. Or perhaps A, B, and C did succeed one another in time, but only at the examined sections. In other unexamined locations, B existed well before A and endured long after C. There is nothing conceptually incoherent about these proposals, but the crucial point is that they become less plausible as more stratigraphic sections are examined. Once, Thomas Jefferson hoped that mastodons might survive in the vast American interior, but as more of the country was explored and settled, this hope became difficult to sustain. In a like fashion, some geologists in the 1830s were happy to postulate that land plants might have existed in the Cambrian period, but by the 1850s, these notions had been mostly confined to the fringes of the geological community. The reason was the absence of a certain kind of evidence, in particular, evidence of land plants preserved alongside characteristic Cambrian fossils. Consider that to postulate that B and C coexisted for a significant period of time is to suggest that at some exposures, at least, members of B should be found in association with members of C. In particular, if either B or C contains a taxon that's widespread in distribution and abundantly preserved in a variety of depositional environments. Members of B and C are not observed in association at any exposure, the claim that B and C coexisted for a significant period of time becomes harder to swallow, and may come to seem indefensible as more exposures are examined. The claim cannot be disproved using fossil evidence alone. Maybe land plants did exist during the Cambrian, despite never being observed in conjunction with any characteristic Cambrian fossils. Yet at some point, the failure to observe B and C in association will tip the balance of evidence in favor of the claim that B and C did not coexist for a significant period of time. Notice that when B and C are taken to be non-overlapping assemblages, and especially if members of B and C are widely distributed and abundantly preserved, this pattern of reasoning can lend support to the claim that C succeeded B at approximately the same time throughout its range. Since if this were not the case, we would expect to find members of B and C preserved together at at least some exposure. Did geologists solve the problem of gnomic measurement then? In a sense, they did. To solve the problem, geologists needed to show, first, that the fossil record preserves a directional signal, and second, that events in the record taken to mark time horizons were roughly synchronous over large geographical areas. And by the middle of the 19th century, both these claims had been rendered fairly plausible. In both cases, the reasons for supporting the claim flowed not from an overarching theoretical warrant, but instead from judgments of plausibility anchored in knowledge of local stratigraphic sections. Yet they were none the weaker for this, and in fact, the absence of a widely recognized theory of paleontological correlation probably saved the practice from disruption, since the most celebrated theories of early 19th century geology were neither universally accepted nor particularly long-lived. To quickly recap, this presentation has been about a startup problem in scientific practice. How were geologists in the 19th century able to solve the problem of gnomic measurement? Roughly speaking, they had two options. The first was to articulate a theory that showed that the fossil record preserves a directional signal and that faunal transitions preserved in the record were roughly synchronous over large geographical areas. The other was to warrant these claims in the absence of an overarching theory. Contrary to Boyd's claim that epistemically successful methods presuppose the existence of an approximately true scientific theory, geologists in the 19th century took the second route and were successful in doing so. Their success did not place paleontological correlation beyond the reach of all doubt, as Huxley's criticism sufficed to show. Yet by the middle of the 19th century, most reasonable doubts about the practice had been effectively assuaged. To those of you who hung with me this whole time, thank you so much for listening. Thank you especially to the people who helped me in preparing this talk. And if you want to read more, the complete version of this paper is forthcoming in Philosophy of Science. Thanks again.